right, I'd like to get started. Welcome to all of you to the uh, first session of LogTech Asia. Uh, so if you're joining us, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, I want to remind you that you can ask uh, questions at any time uh, using the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but you can also make use of the uh, chat uh, on the right side of your screen. Uh, some people are still joining us, uh, but I want to get started because we have a lot of content. And also, uh, I want to give you a chance to, uh, uh, to ask questions and also to work on after the session to answer uh, some of the questions live. So without further ado, I would like to uh, invite uh, Wolfgang uh, Limaher, uh, who is you know, a technology uh, strategist, uh, you know, and uh, he's been uh, working and advising a number of log tech companies across Asia. Uh, so Wolfgang, it's all yours, go ahead. Thank you uh, very much, Max, and uh, welcome to this session about uh, technology and uh, in fact, what the current situation uh, does to uh, technology development. Uh, I have been speaking about technology, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, lock tech uh, over the last, let's say, five years very intensively. And uh, we saw a very good uptake in 2019. Uh, something I was waiting for for some while. And um, with COVID-19 and the current situation, I think it's worth to have a fresh view on the overall landscape of technology development. So where are we now? I just would like to ask everybody to imagine how would that crisis have played out without any technology in place, without internet, without computers, without smartphones? I think it becomes very clear that without technology, we had never been able to continue to operate the way we do today. And there is another effect which uh, will impact the future for, of technology. And this is the fact that we got used to uh, technology. We are now, or many of us, working from home and uh, experience the different digital tools in uh, a much more intense, intensive way than before. And this has given us a better understanding about the abilities of those tools, but also about the limitations. And uh, what, we, uh, what we have seen is that people adapt pretty quickly to uh, new technologies. And therefore, I believe that we are now on the slope of enlightenment. So we have uh, past the point of disillusionment. We have passed the point of doubt about the uh, value of uh, uh, advanced technologies. So this is in fact the Kitty Hawk moment of digitization in business, in supply chain, and in logistics. So where did we come from and where are we going to? The logistics sector has gone through a number of evolutionary steps. There is the phase one, which uh, was the beginning. It started after World War II, where, where the emergence of the uh, logistics sector happened and whether, where we put more structure behind the movement, the storage, the handling of goods. This helped to enter into phase two. And phase two was a massive international expansion on the back of logistics. In phase three, we saw then 
the first digitization efforts. This was the moment where uh, the third industrial revolution brought new tools, uh, new information and communication technology to the industry. That was also the moment where this industry had aggregated sufficient volume to carve out segments, sub-segments of logistics. And one example is the express delivery industry. And in the express delivery industry, we saw a lot of innovation. We saw for the first time clearly defined products. We saw new transportation systems. In fact, we saw for the first time real transportation and logistics systems like hub and spoke. And then came other innovations like the barcode, like track and trace. And this moved the logistics sector into the force uh, phase. And the force phase is the synchronization and integration. Because with technology, it being, became clear that there was a possibility to have one day full end-to-end -end visibility, which allows to manage a transportation network as a whole. And the final phase, which we are entering today, uh, is the um, phase of intelligence and the phase of data, uh, where we use the, the information we get through technology not only to run the network, but also to predict future events, to predict failures in the system, in assets, etc. So where does this innovation come from? In many industries, innovation comes from the incumbents uh, due to high R&D development budgets. In the logistics sector, it is a bit different. The logistics sector is not the only one where it's, where it's different, but it is that in logistics, the innovation comes from a lot from outside. And just think about AI tools, think about Internet of Things devices, um, when think about automation. It is brought by vendors, by other parties to the industry. And this external uh, innovation is very often driven by, by startups. And what we see here is the development in the US uh, of the deal activity from 2006 to 2020. And we see, in fact, a constant uh, increase in uh, deal volume and deal value. And there are some dips, uh, like also the end of last year as a consequence of the overall economic situation driven by the trade tensions, but it was still a very good year and definitely a good year in uh, terms of deal count. And despite COVID-19, the beginning of 2020 was quite, quite good and driven to a large extent by investments in artificial intelligence companies. In 2019, over 1 billion invested in maritime tech. That was the status and that was a record. Um, in fact, 1.14 billion went into startups and scale-ups in the shipping industry. However, if we take off SoftBank's investment in Flexport, we saw a decline of 24% in 2019 from 190 million to 144 million. This represents an in deals of 8%. However, the deal size 
increased, which indicates it's, it's becoming more serious. It increased by 18% from 2.2 million to 2.7 million per deal. What were the most attractive startups? Um, it was about trade facilitation uh, compared to ship operations, ship management, and port management ventures, which were less on the screen of investors. Also, the investor community has changed. Uh, the number of venture funds dedicated to maritime logistics and trade uh, rose by 60% over 18 months worldwide. And what was considered to be areas to watch, uh, API integrations, artificial intelligence, and green tech. How did that play out, this investment in the industry? First, the industry got better organized, meaning actions uh, like the DCSA, the Digital Container Shipping Association emerged. Uh, we need these in institutions, these organizations to drive standardization, to help that we don't have 50 different blockchain solutions driving the container shipping industry, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but still, there is a lot of experimenting, a lot of um, uh, support for startups, which we could see in 2019. Uh, we saw also, also a nice uptake in the area of um, data sharing. Um, we saw that platforms got traction, example is straight lands, but there are also examples in the area of bunker or to make the lives of seafarer easier. Um, then automation made some progress. Um, the reduction of paper is still a challenge and regulatory barriers continue to be seen as hindrances in the industry to uh, digitization. Uh, but 2019 was a very good year because we saw very serious and concrete focused activities of digitization in the industry. What uh, were the changes caused by COVID-19? Um, this is a moment of test, test for us as individuals, but also test for a lot of tools. And these tools will uh, be adopted. They will be improved. Um, I expect that many regulatory barriers to digitization will fall because governments themselves have discovered digitization to service population in difficult, challenging, adverse times like COVID-19. Venture capital is drying up, so innovation might slow, out, slow down a bit. Uh, remote working and operating becomes a very big topic. And um, uh, we will see a lot of changes, uh, not only in the tech space, but also how organizations are structured and set up. Automation uh, will also see an uptake uh, because uh, robots don't get COVID-19 infected, but high capital expenditure items might be put on hold because of more conservative behavior of the companies. Uh, the supply chain design and management practice says uh, will be reviewed, but I don't see a revolutionary change because anyway, over the last 10, 20 years, supply chains um, follow two trends. The one trend is towards digitization and services, and the other trend is towards um, localization and regionalization. So that will be accelerated, um, both, both developments. Uh, overall, I see more adopted digital products meet increasing, increasingly receptive markets. I have five predictions, more automation, more green tech, more platforms, more data, more intelligence. The robot market is booming and this indicates the will and in in fact, the 
activity towards higher levels of automation. And we see this in the area of vehicles, in the warehouses, uh, we see projects coming up in ports uh, beyond terminal automation. I speak about vessel automation, feeder automation, ferry, ferry automation, uh, tugboat automation. Um, and of course, there is a big, big movement in uh, robotic process automation, the automation of processes uh, such as um, chatbot supported customer service processes. But there is much, much more which will be automated uh, in the back office. Despite COVID-19, we should not forget the sustainability agenda. And in fact, I see a lot of enforcement intent, but also a lot of compliance in respect to uh, the IMO 2020 rules. And we will see innovation, <clears throat> innovation due to the pressure on <clears throat> lower emissions and decarbonization of the industry. And this starts with the overall management of the chain uh, to, and, and goes then to the clean port, the cleaner ships. And I see a major, major opportunity in fuel tech, in alternative fuels, which will bring a major change in the uh, shipping industry. The next point is about platforms and platforms at large. Um, COVID-19 uh, forces us to think about more robust, more resilient supply chains, which means we need to put more buffer facilities into the flow, such as a cross docking facility near port to avoid uh, disruption through port congestion. But platforms will be the glue to hold together all technologies and will allow parties to uh, showcase their capabilities and will others allow to tap into them. Uh, at the end, this is at the core of digitization. And platforms, access, allow also to break industry barriers like going into manufacturing uh, without the previous uh, investments and uh, need for knowledge. Data is the big, big topic and uh, those people those companies that have data about the location of their shipment, what is happening to their shipments real time, uh, the conditions of their shipments are much better off in current times of COVID-19. And uh, we see a lot of uh, demand now in the space of Internet of Things driven solution for asset tracking, shipment monitoring. And uh, this is a major opportunity now to uh, make this mainstream. Finally, uh, these solutions will produce a lot of data and that data needs to be analyzed. And data creates visibility. Data creates the base for predictive, uh, for prescriptive analytics. Uh, it helps brands and logistics companies to understand what is going on on the retail side. It helps, helps logistics companies uh, to manage their capacity, transport capacity, inventory capacity. Um, and overall, it reduces risks. Um, but that uh, only if, in addition to the operational, I call it the small data, we add also big data and enrich what we have uh, on our internal screen and zoom on specific dis dis situations and use intelligence to solve challenges. Um, COVID-19 is prime time for cyber criminals and uh, we should not forget we are now working from home, less 
uh, firewalls, less protection, less experience with this environment. So this creates vulnerability. Also, uh, IT teams and cyber, cyber teams are stretched at that point. So that also uh, creates vulnerabilities. And what is the path the companies should take? It's about taking paper out of the supply chain, um, replicate the physical reality in the digital space. Uh, we do this usually in parts of the supply chain, then integrate the parts to a whole, uh, which uh, then gives the end-to-end -end visibility and the end-to-end -end data which needs to be compiled. And all that should be packaged in a sustainable uh, framework to ensure that uh, we also protect the future of our next generations. Finally, I think this is a moment of action and uh, action beyond the coping with the crisis. Uh, I see a major wave coming, a major wave of digitization which needs to be structured. Uh, companies could consider a digital push and organize an internal initiative ask their teams to map their process and, and look again at all the pain points, review at the reports with the help of specialists, of digitization specialists, um, together with the vendors, uh, evaluate, make, buy, partner and invest strategies and see whether we can, in fact, use also this crisis to implement a continuous process of digitization and adjusting with what is happen, happening outside the company. Because that will help that in the next 20 years, we don't see again 50% of the Fortune 500 companies disappearing because of gaps in their digitization strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Okay, uh, so let's um, go ahead and take some questions now. Um, I've got a, one first question for you, Wolfgang. Uh, we've seen uh, in the past few months uh, some uh, ongoing activity around funding. Some of the startups have been you know, able to actually raise funding uh, despite you know, the current situation. What would be your advice to you know, lock tech uh, companies who are currently talking to investors Obviously, things are getting slower. It's be becoming a bit more complicated for investors to evaluate the deals. But what would be your advice to those startups who want to continue engaging with those investors? Yeah, there is no general advice. It depends on the startup. There's, there are clearly startups which are much more attractive currently for investors, such as uh, everything which is linked to e-commerce uh, is highly attractive because the the sector is still still functioning very well and, and we'll also see a lot of tailwind. Uh, I think um, those will also not have the challenge. They, uh, what, what, uh, they could consider, so if the, the money is drying up a bit, uh, is to go for a bridge uh, situation to run instead of, instead of a full round, run a bridge round and uh, raise less capital. Uh, because there is, of course, a tendency now to push down valuation. And uh, you have to be prepared for this, uh, that in that bridge round, the conditions might be less favorable than those in the last round. And okay. another, another advice is go, go beyond your region. It's probably um, a good moment to test the global uh, investor market. All right, thank you, Wolfgang. Okay, we've got a question from Sumia uh, in the uh, Q&A tab. You can uh, look at it, Wolfgang. Uh, but uh, he said, the share of platforms like Trailands for continent digitization will increase from X percent to Y percent in the next five years. Do those platforms follow the winner takes all approach? Uh, you know, if Maersk, Mitsui join here, will all the shipping companies join here and other platforms will die? I don't believe that all platforms, all other platforms will die. Uh, I believe there is room for, for more than one platform and even more than two. Um, on the other hand, I see uh, that TradeLens has overcome the initial resistance uh, in the industry 
and convinced uh, um, a big, big share of the um, of the industry to join. Um, but but we don't shouldn't see it only shouldn't see it only vertical. There are a lot of platforms in in different markets. So. Um, yeah, to answer the question, um, there, will be, there will be more than Maersk and uh, nevertheless Maersk will pay, play its, uh, its role in the digitization of the container industry. Okay, can you give some example of Asian startups who are working on optimizing inventory and capacity using AI or machine learning? That, that's a hard one, but um, a hard one to speak about because I'm involved in some. And, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, if, you, if you look just at the, um, at the speakers list here, you will find uh, already a number of startups doing exactly this or focusing exactly on this. And um, it is not easy to see, in fact, um, because we always think in technology, and this is a good moment to, to make that point, but it's about solution. So you, you want to have an inventory management solution. You would like to have a demand sensing solution, but there might be different technologies which are needed to get there. And you might need AI or you might not need, need AI. You might need blockchain or you might not. And, uh, so when you look at the startups, uh, look behind the solutions and see what, what technology is really behind. Okay, the next question from mine relates to of obviously blockchain, which has been a hot topic in the last you know, uh, one or two years. Uh, but again, but you know, it looks like this, the bubble has popped up. Uh, there's a lot more, uh, you know, a lot less excitement around blockchain in the past few months. So what, you know, question from Mike is, what, is the, what do you think is the uptake of blockchain in the supply chain? And is there a standard that the industry is agreeing on? I take the last. I don't believe that much in standards, standards being agreed uh, quickly. Uh, it's all in flux. It's very hard to agree on a standard. Um, on the other hand, I, I, I agree with the fact that the, that the, end, the thrill is gone <laughs> like B.B. King said, um, but the uh, technology uh, is still there. And uh, if you speak to the, to the technicians, and it's uh, hard to get technology, hard to understand technology, but if you speak with the, the IT professionals, they will tell you that blockchain technology can do things other software cannot. And if that is the case, uh, then it has its place. And uh, we will see a lot of blockchain behind the, the solution uh, phase I mentioned before, uh, which will play out. And um, in fact, yesterday was the launch uh, of, uh, in fact, today, because it was launched in the US, it was launched globally, but yesterday was the launch of the World Economic Forum Blockchain Toolkit. And it's uh, online and uh, worth uh, having a look because it is a guide for companies that are interested in implementing blockchain solutions. Question on the chat box uh, from Vadim, uh, who say we have a new concept solution and the question is how should we come to the vendors market of Southeast Asia where everyone is at home? What's the best way to choose a reliable partner in Asia? And then the question is what was the most impressive game-changing technology in the industry for you, Wolfgang? Uh, good, good question. Um, I didn't get the first fully, uh, but the, the game-changing technology, I believe that we are now in the most game-changing moment, and this because of uh, a new uh, level of asset tracking and shipment monitoring. So I, I see uh, visibility making a quantum leap now because uh, uh, people have very little visibility in COVID-19 and they will, they will change that. And, and therefore, I also believe that uh, track and trace was a major uh, step forward. Uh, before that, it was the container. Um, 
And uh, yeah, the future will definitely be around analytics. So it's the, my, my line of thinking um, where the, uh, the um, tech innovations uh, lie. Welcome. what's your take on those last mile delivery uh, startups that we've seen? A huge amount of investment pouring into, you know, the Lala Move and the Ninja and Gogovan and uh, and also recently in places like Vietnam, we've seen Logivan pop up. Uh, there's been startup like Scooter in Thailand coming up. Uh, and so, you know, is the space still hard? Do you, do you anticipate to see consolidation among those big players who have obviously a lot of cash? Yeah, the, hard, the last mile is the hardest bit in a logistic system. So um, it is hard to make money on that, uh, on that last mile, uh, which means that you need enormous volume, you need to be a big player, and therefore there will be consolidation. It is also an indispensable uh, leg of our future life. Because what we have seen now is after the shopping malls came to our homes through e-commerce, after the banks came to our homes through e-banking, and now work comes to our home. So we become a home-based uh, spaces. And that means you need this last mile delivery, but it's a hard, hard uh, place to, to be in. To make money, yeah. To make money. It's, so yeah, it's a bit like e-commerce. It's a very hot, hot space, but it's hard to make money out of, of e-commerce. But, but as always, some will manage to do so. So obviously those big players are burning cash right now. Uh, they're probably not all making money. So do, do, do you think that there will be consolidation at some point between those yeah, players? Yeah, there will be consolidation. Yeah. And um, I believe it will at the end be also a technology play because it's, it's volume and managing this volume through, through smart uh, technology. Just one last question. What is the impact of Grab, which potentially could merge with Gojek, uh, on the, you know, on logistic innovation in general? I mean, obviously, those companies have big ambitions in expanding uh, and continuing to be big players in all these different markets in Asia. But what do you think is going to happen with those, uh, those two companies, if they merge, for example? I think this is related to the next, to the last question, the, the previous one we had. Um, they, they become important players in the logistics concept, uh, in, the, in the space of home delivery. Uh, and uh, what, how I see them or their role in the industry, they are lighthouse startups. They, they give hope. They, they uh, drive innovation because a lot of people see that exponential growth is possible. So they also will trigger a lot of innovation in uh, other areas. Okay, one final question from Manoj, which just came up. Which companies are currently leading the technological development of transparent end-to-end -end supply chain management? I Another believe from a type of, of, of company, it's more in the uh, big supply chain operators. And uh, I, I don't, as I don't like to talk too much about individual companies, but I, I cited a lot Flex, uh, which is uh, uh, a, um, a technology company uh, based in Singapore. So it's also here, um, which has uh, developed, uh, I think state of the art supply chain management uh, practices uh, about supply chain mapping, about big data analytics, risk management, um, using uh, in-house tools and uh, off-the-shelf technology and uh, operating out of a pulse center, uh, which is a coordination and enlightenment room uh, in California, where they pull together all information from all over the world uh, to react to any kind of disruption, um, whether it's caused due to uh, reasons in the network or from outside, uh, very swiftly moving, uh, 
manufacturing from out of China into India, or from India into Mexico, from Mexico into California and back, dependent on the global situation. Okay, and the company is called Flex, you say? Flex. Flex. Former Flex. Yeah, former okay. Flextronics. Ah, former Flextronics. Okay, all right, excellent. All right, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thank you for all the attendees uh, for those questions. We have another speaker who actually just started to speak already. Uh, so I want to end uh, these sessions. Again, if you have more questions, if you would like to meet Wolfgang, uh, we will have a virtual networking right after the panel discussion at 11.30 uh, today, 11.30 Hong Kong, Singapore time. So join us, obviously, hopefully Wolfgang, you will be with us. And again, continue watching all the sessions. We have a lot of content, a lot of good presentation today. So thank you very much again, Wolfgang. I will see you on the next session. My pleasure, Max. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was a great presentation. So I just want to remind you very uh, briefly that you can ask questions at any time uh, using the comment sections at the bottom of the screen. The speakers are here. Uh, they will take your questions and answer them in real time. Um, also, if you uh, want to join us on chain.net, we have created a special group uh, where you guys can meet uh, the delegates and speakers. We will also be uh, sharing content on log tech, uh, you know, on that group. So you should have received already an invitation uh, from chain.net. Uh, join us uh, there for uh, further discussion. Last thing also at 11.30, we have a panel discussion uh, with different speakers. And right after the panel, we will have a virtual networking uh, where you can actually uh, be, you'll be able to meet with the speakers and delegates. Uh, like in a normal networking, we have created a virtual lounge uh, where you guys can actually go from table to table and meet with the delegates and speakers you know, in a very cool environment. Uh, it's all online and uh, you'll be able to have face-to-face -face discussion with the different delegates and speakers. So check it out. Uh, join us at 11.30. All right, thank you and I hope you're enjoying uh, the next uh, session. <laughs>